So, so the second talk will be by, by Jeremy Costel. Um, so uh, for those of you who are just arriving, let me uh, explain that uh, today we're experimenting with, with two uh, new things uh, on the way we function and see how it works. And the first thing is that uh, there are some people who can ask questions uh, at any time they want. And um, so for this session, the, these people will be uh, Yugu. So let me see if uh, he can speak, still speak. Can, can you speak, you? Yes, I can speak. Hello, everyone. Awesome. Um, then we have Sanjay. Sanjay, can, can you speak? Hi, this is Sanjay. Yes, OK, we sort of hear you. And, and uh, Misha Shkornikov. Misha, still working? Yes. I think it's all right. Um, and uh, as in the previous talk, you, you can, and as usual, you can still uh, uh, write things in the chat. And uh, unless uh, things are resolved immediately, uh, I will uh, bring the question to the attention of the speaker. So um, now that this is said, uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jeremy Costel. He, he will speak about integrable fluctuations in one plus one dimensional growth models. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for being here. Okay, so so thanks a lot. Um, thanks to the organizers and um, and hi everybody. Um, this is going to be a sort of survey talk um, about um, our recent results with uh, Dan Remenek and uh, Konstantin Matetsky about the um, universal processes that one sees in the limit of KPZ class models. So, um, well, the model you see in front of you is a um, is a off lattice Eden model. Um, so, you've got a cluster growing um, particles. Um, which are neighbor to the cluster are joining it at rate one. And you can see the pink ones are the ones that just joined. And you can think of this as a model of something like a, uh, a uh, bacterial colony or a tumor or um, perhaps people who are not social distancing. Um, so uh, <laughs> the one thing... <laughs> uh, the one, the one thing which uh, we know classically is that such things look grow grow like at rate t and and, and look like a, uh, a, a um, some sort of um, shape. Um, but we're interested more in the fluctuations of the boundary. So, if you're imaginative and you look in this sort of forty five degree direction, then the the surface looks a little bit like a like a function, and that's the kind of universal process that we want to see. So the thing's growing at some rate c t, and of course, if you were really interested in the present emergency, you'd really want to know what this capital C was. We don't actually. That's not universal. Um, what's universal is the size of the fluctuations on top of that. So. The, the boundary is a little bit, not exactly at CT, it's at CT plus some T to the one third. And then on top of that, there's this process which governs the fluctuation of this boundary, which is a thing I'm calling A. And it lives on a scale of T to the two thirds, lateral scale. And this A is some universal stochastic process, uh, which is called the Airy process. And we know it because we know the finite dimensional distributions of it. Okay, so those are the kind of things we're going to talk about. Now, of course, for models like this, um, we know essentially nothing except that there's some large C and it's growing at that rate. And in this model, because it's off lattice, the thing will actually be a ball. Um, the best anyone knows about models like this in two dimensions and things like first passage percolation is the fluctuations are somewhat less than two to the one half by some logs. Okay, so one simplification we can make, because you can see there's already a problem, because this thing doesn't really look like a function except locally in that direction, is to look at directed models. So the simplest directed model is this model of ballistic aggregation, 
And now the growth is off a one dimensional substrate, which is the one dimensional lattice Z. And at every site, there's a tower of particles and particles are falling from the sky as a rate one plus one process at every site independently. So the particles pile up, but there's a non-trivial thing in this model, which is that the particles are sticky. And so as we see in the picture, if a particle falls, it can stick to the side as well as on top of the other particles. So that's the non-trivial thing that's happening here. And that's what you see after a long time. You see this very non-trivial growth. And the main thing is that the growth is not just upwards, but outwards. So again, one expects to see, but has no idea how to prove that this thing is growing at some rate CT. Actually, sorry, that, that it's growing at some rate CT, one can actually prove, though don't, nobody knows what the capital C is by the subadditive ergodic theorem. But um, on top of that, um, again, one should see these fluctuation, the whole height should have a fluctuation of size t to the one third. And then in the lateral direction, you'll see some other stochastic process, looks locally like a Brownian motion. I'm calling it A1. A1 is the area one process, which is not the same as the process we saw in the previous slide, because here we started with a flat interface as opposed to a single seed, which gave us a curved interface in the previous model. But again, we have these universal one third as the size of a fluctuation and t to the two thirds as the lateral size of the fluctuations. But there's a new process. And what we learn from this is that we're supposed to see a process which depends on the initial data. And so the real question of this slide is what are these universal processes that one's supposed to see, what are their finite dimensional distributions? Again, for ballistic aggregation, there's essentially no results. Now, Carter Percy Zhang introduced their KPZ equation as a model for uh, the ballistic aggregate and identified the three basic things which are driving the growth. Okay, so the three things, let's start from the right here. Um, there's a driving space-time white noise, which we saw in the previous talk. And you can just think of that as a random kick independently at every space-time point. And then there's a Laplacian term, which is supposed to relax the interface, keep it an interface, try to make sure it's not getting too wild. Now, if you just look at those two terms, one of them is trying to make the interface rough and one of them is trying to smooth it out. They actually balance each other and produce something which looks at least locally like a Brownian motion. And you can see the interface here looks at least locally like a Brownian motion, or at least if you're imaginative, it does. <laughs> okay. Okay, but then there's the third one, the key term here, which is the lateral growth mechanism, which is this dxh squared. So where does that come from? Well, if you look at this little picture of the lateral growth, this, this picture here, the growth isn't just occurring in the vertical direction. The main mechanism in all these models is that the growth is appearing outwards. And therefore, the vertical component of the growth is some nonlinear function of the slope. And that's the only thing you have to know because you can just put in any nonlinear function you want. And it turns out that essentially the object you get doesn't depend on what nonlinear function you put there. So we can just put the simplest nonlinear function, which is a quadratic. Okay. So that's how you get this KPZ equation. It's a stochastic partial differential equation for a height function, h, t, x. And here, of course, x is in R. So it's a continuum equation. And this is the equation the physicists really like uh, for random growth. 
of course, because the interface is supposed to be at least locally looking like a Brownian motion, DXH should at least locally look like a white noise. And so the square of white noise is a ill-defined object and it needs some sort of infinite renormalization to make sense of it. So that's what Martin Hare did. As long as you subtract a proper infinity from this thing, uh, it's, it's well-defined and there's a good well posedness theory for it. Of course, it's also true that H can just be written as the log of a, another partial differential equation, the multiplicative stochastic heat equation. And um, that one actually can be defined using classic Edo calculus. Okay, so again, what we're supposed to see in the KPZ equation is the same thing we saw in the, in the um, ballistic aggregate, which is that the fluctuation should be of size t to the one third. And here from the picture, we started with a flat interface. So the fluctuation process again is supposed to be this area one process. I haven't told you what it is, but we'll see what these processes are a little later. Um, and they live on a lateral scale of size t to the two thirds. That lateral scale, you should think of that means that that's the scale at which there's uh, non-trivial correlations. If you go shorter than that scale, all you see is a Brownian motion. And if you go much longer than that scale, uh, the thing, uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it completely decorrelates. Okay. Um, all right, now the, the t to the one third height fluctuations and the t to the two third lateral scale can be rephrased in the following way, what we call the one, two, three scaling. So you can think what we really have is a small parameter epsilon. And if you do this one, two, three scaling to your height function h, so you look at it on a scale epsilon to the minus three halves t, so that's the three, and epsilon minus one x, that's the two, then the fluctuation should be of size epsilon to the minus a half, and so you have to rescale them down by epsilon one half. And then you expect to see something non-trivial. Well, it, of course, if you're looking at this fluctuation scale, then the, the bulk movement of the entire system, this CT, will just look enormous. It'll look like size epsilon minus one. So you have to subtract this epsilon minus one times t times some constant. And so one expects, and this is just a rephrasing of what we've said, that this one, two, three rescaled object of the height functions should have some universal limiting process. And so we're thinking, fix a t, and rescale like this, and there should be some universal stochastic process, which is a function of x, and we'd all like to know its finite dimensional distributions. Okay. Now, I'd like to compare this to the standard case. So the standard case, uh, if you didn't have the lateral growth mechanism, so the nonlinearity was dropped out of the KPZ equation, then it's an equation we all know. It's just an infinite dimensional ornstein uhlenbeck process. Physicists call this guy the Edwards-Wilkinson model. Now, if you had this, then the scaling would actually be, uh, well, it would be the scaling that in the first part of Hubert's talk. Um, it's a one, two, four scaling. So you have a diffusive scaling in time relative to space, and then the fluctuations are, again, of size epsilon minus a half, so they have to be scaled down by epsilon one half. Another way to say this is that, it, and, and the, the interface just fluctuates up and down. There's no, there's no gross movement. So the constant in front of the T is just zero. So the size of the fluctuation in the interface translated down below is actually, it's actually t to the one quarter uh, instead of t to the one third. And I just, and, and the lateral size of the fluctuation is t to the one half instead of t to the two thirds. These are easy to calculate because the model's Gaussian, you can just compute everything. Um, this is just to emphasize the point that KPZ fluctuations are super diffusive, not sub diffusive. 
it's not that you were expecting to see a t to the one half size fluctuations. You're expecting to see t to the one quarter fluctuations. And so the one third is a super diffusive constant. Okay. Now for KPZ itself, we don't know uh, these universal fluctuations very well. Okay, so what's known about KPZ? Okay, um, so what we do know about the KPZ equation itself is one point distributions of the limit of the one, two, three rescaled object. Um, well, we actually know the one point distributions exactly. Sorry, I, I, I spoke wrongly there. We, we, have, we know the one point distributions exactly for the KPZ equation for a few special initial conditions. Very, very few. So narrow wedge, half Brownian. So what narrow wedge means is you can think of H as the log of the multiplicative stochastic heat equation and you're starting that stochastic heat equation with the delta function. That's called the narrow wedge initial condition because the log of a delta function you can think of as log of a Gaussian with a very, very small time. So log of that looks like log of e to the minus x squared over t. So it's like basically minus x squared over t where t is getting close to zero. So that's called a narrow wedge. It looks like that. Or half Brownian, which is starting the stochastic heat equation with zero on one side and um, e to a Brownian motion on the other side. So that the half Brownian is a Brownian for, for KPZ, the H is a Brownian on one side and minus infinity on the other side. So there's, these conditions are natural from the point of view of KPZ, but it, perhaps a bit weird from our standard point of view. Um, there's only one or two others. And then one is able by certain miracles to compute this crazy generating function here. So this is the expectation of e to the minus e to the h minus r. You can think of r as kind of like the variable in the distribution function. And these things are given by exact formulas as determinants of i minus certain operators. And the operator is something where you give it this initial condition. They depend on the initial condition. And then given a t x r, you have an operator K and you take its Fredholm determinant and that gives you the formula. The way these things are derived is there's some discrete version of the model, perhaps the asymmetric simple exclusion process with the asymmetry going to zero or the six vertex model in more recent work by people like Ivan Corwin and Amal Agarwal. Um, and in these models, there's some magic combinatorial identities which allow you to actually compute formulas which are just discrete versions of this formula. And then one takes a limit and one gets a formula like this. But everything relies on these magic combinatorial formulas. And so it's extremely dependent on the initial data. So one only has these one point distributions for a few special uh, initial conditions. Okay. So we're gonna concentrate on TASEP. KSEP's a special discretization of the KPZ equation, which we can actually solve. And that's mostly what I want to talk about in this talk, the formulas for TSEP and the limit, which we got with uh, Constantine and Daniel two years ago, and then some new versions recently. Okay, so what we're interested in TSEP, and TSEP, let's just describe it now. So, TSEP you can either think of as a height function or as particles on the lattice Z. So the height function is a simple random walk path by which I just mean that from X to X plus one, it either goes up or down by one. So we're looking at those are the space of height functions we're allowed and they can be encoded as particles. Whenever you have an up, you put a particle on the lattice beneath it. So I hope the picture's clear. The particles just correspond to ups in the height function. And we are going to consider the model where there's always a rightmost particle here called x1. 
Or in terms of the height function, you can think that after a certain point, it just goes down. OK, so that's TASAP. And if you start with such a thing, it always remains so. So the rule in TASAP is that a local maximum jumps to a local minimum at rate 1. And you can see that that's exactly the same thing as a particle jumping to the right at rate 1, but not being allowed to jump if there's a particle in the way. So that's the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. So let's just see it. The, the heights will jump and the particles with them. So here we have jumps and particles moving with them. And that's the whole model. That's all TASEP does. OK. Now you may ask why I say this thing has anything to do with the KPZ equation. It's actually a discretization of the KPZ equation. If you look at the uh, dynamics here, the rate of change of the height function, dh, is actually just um, minus 2 times the indicator function that you have a local maximum at that side. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Uh, someone is asking uh, if you could also consider larger jump, maybe a little size 2 or 3. Right. You could consider it, and um, that would be a model in which we once again can't prove anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank so, you. So there, uh, you can consider all sorts of things. <laughs> um, but uh, what I'm going to say is restricted to six models. All right. Go on. Thank you. Okay. Um, of course, if you had such a model, you would expect everything to be true that I'm saying, but it's completely open how to prove it. Okay, so just going back here. Um, yeah, so the rate of jumping down, well, well, when it jumps down, it jumps down by two. So you just have dh is minus two times this indicator function of a local max. And then, well, there's funny calculus because if you have a function h where the forward difference, so grad plus just means h of x plus one minus h of x, and grad minus means h of x minus h of x minus one. So these are just the forward and backward difference operators. But these are always just plus or minus ones. So it happens that in such cases, there's not too many choices. So it, if you just check, minus two times the indicator function of a local max is actually a half times grad minus h grad plus h plus the discrete Laplacian of h minus one. So you can see already that this thing is exactly a discretization of the KPZ equation. Now, it doesn't converge to the KPZ equation in any sense. It's a discretization which lives parallel to the KPZ equation, expected to have the same behavior. But if you wanted convergence to the KPZ equation, what you would do is you would have down jumps and up jumps of the same type. And you would choose the rate of jumping down and the rate of jumping up to be very close to each other, but with a slight asymmetry. And in the diffusive scaling limit, if you choose that asymmetry to be epsilon 1 half, then you'll actually get the KPZ equation in the limit. But even changing this model from just jumping down to jumping down and jumping up will ruin all the exact solvability that I'm going to talk about. OK. So the question is, if I take this height function evolving like this, and now look at the one, two, three rescaled height function, we expect to see some universal processes in the limit. We take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And I'd like to know for fixed t, the finite dimensional distribution of those objects. Okay. So first, uh, so I'll tell you the simplest result first. So the simplest result Oh, here's just a picture of this thing going down. So this was, sorry, this is just a picture of uh, the TASEP um, started from all packed particles to the left of the origin. OK, and you can see this is, this is this airy process, the first airy process, the curved airy process that I drew, and it's being compared to a red parabola. OK, so here's the simplest case. Um, 
the simplest case, we're going to start TASEP with a flat initial condition. So flat initial condition is just particle, no particle, particle, no particle, particle, no particle. Um, and we do this one, two, three rescaling, subtract off the constant, which I think is just epsilon minus one times a quarter. And now we look at the distribution function and take a limit. And you will get this function f of t and r. Now notice this function f, t, and r doesn't depend on x. And that's because we started with the flat initial condition. So I'm just starting with the simplest thing. Uh, it doesn't depend on x because, of course, flat initial condition, you expect spatial homogeneity. So there's no dependence on x. So this is the one point distribution starting from the flat initial condition at some time t later. And r is the distribution function variable. So we take the second log derivative of f and we call it phi. And the surprising result is that phi satisfies KDV. Okay. So just looking at this thing, I think we've never seen in probability this guy come up before. In probability, we're sort of used to this guy, d squared. Oops, doesn't look very good. d squared is the generator of Brownian motion. And KPZ is kind of a world where this d squared got replaced by d cubed. That's what we're going to see. Okay. Right, so me have a question. Sorry? Question? Uh, I have a question, yes. Um, if you don't look at this f, but look at the, the, the derivative of f with respect to r. So if you don't look at the CDF, but look at the density. Yes. Is there an equation set by the density or some functionals of the density? Yeah, well, there's an equation which involves the density and its integral. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I could show it to you later. I mean, it's just equivalent to KDV. Nice. Okay, thanks. This is the nicest way to write it. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to go to, um, to more to general initial data, one point distribution. Okay, so general initial data. Um, well, we have to assume that our initial height function for this h sub zero, when we do this one, two, three scaling, the initial height function has some limit. So that limit I'm calling this frac h zero x. So there's some limit of the diffusively rescaled initial height function. And that'll be our sort of asymptotic initial data. And now we look at the one, two, three rescaled TASEP height function. And we look at its distribution function. And now, of course, it depends on x because we had general initial data. So now we have a function f, t, r, and x. R is the distribution function variable, and t and x are the position I'm looking at this one point distribution. And I, again, I take phi is the second log derivative of f. And it satisfies a two dimensional version of the KDV equation, uh, KP. You can see in here, this guy here, this, this is KDV. So it's basically saying that dr of KDV. Uh, you know, evolves with dx squared of phi. Uh, Kp and Kdv are, are, are famous integrable PDEs. Um, okay, so the next step is to look at multidimensional distributions. So we're going to fix a time t, and now we want to know the multipoint distribution starting from some general initial data. So uh, it's the same setup, but now we're looking at um, the n-dimensional distribution, f, fixed time t, though. All of these are at fixed time t, uh, f, t, x1 through xn, and r1 through rn. Uh, now, of course, um, these can be thought of as um, transition probabilities, because we have a general initial data and now once we have endpoint distributions, that will determine a general distribution. So endpoint distributions are enough. So this is about, this is all the information 
one needs. Okay, so we take this F and now it satisfies a matrix equation. So the F, we take dr of log F and it turns out to be the trace of a matrix Q and Q and its derivative together satisfy a matrix version of the KP equation. And um, well, I don't think anybody in a few seconds can appreciate this equation so much. Yeah, so actually uh, I, I, would, I would like to ask a couple of questions. So, so, what, what, so, so first in the probability, just to be sure I understand, it's uh, for each i, this, this probability is satisfied, is that right? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Oh, in, in, the, in the probability, in the second line? Yeah. There is a, this i inside the probability. Oh yeah, that should say for each i, I equals, this is- That should say i equals one to n, yeah. And the capital Q, can, can we understand what it is or? or uh, yeah, but you don't want to ask that question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's a Q. So there exists a Q, that, that's your statement. There exists a Q, okay. that's right. There exists a Q and, uh, and little Q, which is just its derivative. They're evolving according to this matrix KP equation, some crazy equation. And I think, I think the thing you should look at and the thing you should be more surprised actually is that the equation is in these variables T, R, and X, but R is just the sum of all the R's and X is just the sum of all the X's. Okay, that's actually the big surprise. Though not so much all the form of this equation. Okay, so, um, okay. So basically, Aram, can I actually quickly follow up on JC's question? Yeah. What, what is the dimension of capital Q? So is it n by oh, n? Q is an n by n matrix. Yeah. Sorry. I see. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Q is an n by n matrix uh, valued function of, of T and all the X's and all the R's. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the, <laughs> the question, why? <laughs> why, what, what on earth is going on here? Uh, there I have KP written. Um, and the answer is, um, I, I have no idea why. N not the slightest idea. Um, the proof is by algebra. Um, so we, it's something we can prove without understanding. Um, if you ask where the KP equation and KDV come from, they're classically derived from shallow water waves. Um, and there seems to be no connection whatsoever to the present situation. And in fact, the type of initial data, I didn't talk about the initial data, but the type of initial data we have are just have nothing to do with the classical story of KDV and KP. But actually, it, there's a much deeper question then why you get KP and KDV and this matrix KP, which is why should the endpoint distribution satisfy a closed equation? That is a very strange thing. That's not something you ever see. They should satisfy hierarchical equations in terms of each other, not a closed equations for each end. Okay. Now, um, Many of you may have seen that if you start with flat initial data, you're supposed to get the Tracy Widom GOE distribution. And if you start with um, step initial data, you're supposed to get the Tracy Widom GUE distribution. But now those are seen to be just some special cases of this KP equation. And in fact, if you take the KP equation and you realize that the flat data is uh, stationary and the step data is stationary after subtraction of a parabola. And then you look at the self-similarity from the uh, one, two, three rescaling, then the KP equation is just reduced to Panlet A2 and you immediately get the tracy Winham distributions. So these tracy Winham distributions are nothing but time one of some special self-similar solutions of KP. Um, furthermore, uh, although I didn't state it like that, I stated it as the one, two, three rescaled limit of TASEP, but there's actually a, a Markov process in the limit. 
HTX. So I didn't have to write limit of the one, two, three rescale taste up. There's actually a process there, which is a special one, two, three invariant markup process, uh, which we call the KPZ fixed form. Um, the KBZ fixed point and TASEP are um, special markup processes where, whose transition probabilities are given by Fredholm determinants, which I'm going to explain now. Um, if you're a little bit wary of Fredholm determinants, you shouldn't be. Uh, all you need to know is that the Fredholm determinant uh, is a continuous function of K and well approximated by finite dimensional versions of K. So you could take this operator K and just approximated by finite dimensional distributions in which case this determinant would just be a classical determinant of a matrix. And this is all true as long as you, the K is a compact operator with finite trace norm. The, and the trace norm is just the sum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues calculated by multiplicity. Um, now, how do we get these KDV and KP equations? Well, actually, we're just following Tracy Widom. So Tracy Widom initially got Fredholm determinant formula for the GUE distribution. And then by calculation, very similar to what we're doing, or we're following them, they derive pan leve formulas for the GUE distribution. I'll show you some of these later. Um, the key point is that if you have a Fredholm determinant, the first thing you want to do, if it's Fredholm determinant of an operator K, which depends on some parameter, say R, the first thing you want to do is differentiate the log of the determinant because the derivative of the log of the determinant is just a trace. And traces are nice linear things you can actually compute. Okay, so all the calculations that we're doing, we start with a determinant and then we do this calculation, and then you differentiate in all the many variables, get enorm traces of enormous strings of operators. And the equations come from integration by parts and identification of exact derivatives. There's many, many integration by parts. OK. Now, this exact same method, actually, if you look at the formulas for the KPZ equation for those very special initial data, narrow wedge or half Brownian, show that they too also satisfy KP, which is a very intriguing fact. Now, it's not known how general this is for the KPZ equation. Um, it seems there's a proto formula for KPZ with flat initial data. And it appears that it does not satisfy KP. So there's a bit of a mystery going on. A okay. question for the yeah. initial data for TASEP, the H0, is it deterministic or can it be stochastic also? Right. So um, this whole story is a story about deterministic initial data. In principle, stochastic initial data, you would um, be averaging over the deterministic initial data. And if you're averaging, a nonlinear equation. So you would not expect it in general to satisfy KP, but there's a bit of a crazy fact that, for example, half Brownian initial data for uh, this KPZ fixed point, it still does satisfy KP. So some, some random initial data actually work. Um, and that's not very well understood why that would be true either. But it's probably very, very special. So Johnny, I think you already said it, but I, I, I am going to ask it for just to make sure I understand. So, so for the KPZ equation, you're saying that this, this function with the two derivatives in R satisfies this KP equation, but only for specific initial conditions. Is that right? Yeah, we only know it now for narrow wedge and half rounding. Ah, but, but it could be that it's true for other initial conditions, but it's, it's still a mystery. Yes. I see. It, it's absolutely unclear how far it goes. Um, it's also true for, for, for two-sided Brownian with drifts, but they ha you have to put the drifts on. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a kind of schematic picture of what's going on in this universe of KBZ models. So this is a, it's very schematic. This is a huge infinite dimensional universe of, of 
of models, including all sorts of markup processes. And all these models have some function H. Um, and in Hubert's talk, the H is the free energy. Um, so those models are all included as well. And um, what's supposed to happen is that there, in this, in this, uh, in this space, there's this rescaling, this one, two, three rescaling. And as you do that, these models all are supposed to be sucked into this universal KPZ fixed point process. Um, there's another fixed point in the universe, which is this Gaussian fixed point, this Edwards Wilkinson fixed point. And it's got a different scaling, this, uh, this one, two, four scaling down here. And in that universe, under that scaling, um, models which have a, can be tuned with a, with a weak parameter can be rescaled into this Edwards Wilkinson model. And so basically down there, there's a thin layer around the, um, which I've drawn in pink around the Edwards Wilkinson manifold uh, in which SPDE methods work and you can rescale either to the Edwards Wilkinson model or by holding the asymmetry um, at the right scale as you rescale, you can actually scale into the KPZ equation. The KPZ equation is a heteroclinic orbit joining these two universal fixed points. So it's got a parameter lambda, the coupling constant. And as lambda goes to zero, you just get Edwards Wilkinson. And effectively, as lambda goes to infinity, it scales to the KPZ fixed point. Um, these two fixed points have uh, different symmetries. So the, the, the Edwards Wilkinson fixed point is symmetric under, under flipping the height function or flipping time. It, it, it just gives itself so it reproduces. Um, the KPZ fixed point, you have to do both at the same time. So if you, if you change the height function to minus the height function, you have to change time to minus time as well. That's skew reflection invariance. It's believed that all models in this class um, converge under the one, two, three scaling to the KPZ fixed point. Um, but it's only proved for this, for this few bunch of uh, special models that we have down here. I'm going to talk about TASA. Okay. So, um, and, and basically SPDE methods can only work down at the very bottom. <laughs> Anything above here, all we've got is exact, cal all we've got is exact calculations up here, up here. So this is just algebra. Okay. Okay, so let's um, talk about the TASEP transition probability. So this is the exact formula for the transition probabilities of TASEP. Um, hopefully I'll have a few minutes at the end to tell you where the formula came from. Um, so we've got um, the M dimensional distributions of the TASEP height function at time T and it's given by a determinant of I minus an operator, and the operator is produced out of your initial and final condition. So the initial condition here is just this step function, and I've labeled the, the tops of these peaks uh, yi di. And then there's a little transformation. Oh, they should be called yi bi. There's a typo. Sorry. Um, there's a little transformation to, to d's and S's. Um, so the formula, so if you read the formula, the, there, there's a few key things in the formula. Out of your initial condition and your final condition, you produce some operators R. And those operators are actually fairly simple. So let's look at one of them. Let's look at R final condition, RFC. So what RFC is, is the identity minus Q. Now Q is just the generator of a geometric random walk to some power. And now what you do after that is you have a bunch of series of Qs and indicator functions, which is nothing but the transition probabilities of a geometric walk to actually stay above the final condition. The initial condition operator, RIC, is just the same thing, but upside down. So you produce these operators, and then there's some mediating operators, 
which are quite simple things, e to the minus t over two times the minus difference operator, which is actually just the generator of a Poisson process, and then some more cues. So the formula is not nearly as hard as it, as it looks. All you have to do is calculate the transition probabilities of a geometric walk to stay above your initial and final condition, and then take the Fredholm determinant, and that gives you the transition probabilities. Now, after the whole story, you can actually just check that this uh, formula satisfies the forward or backward equation, the Kolmogorov equation, or the Fokker-Planck equation, and it's the unique solution. So, so, so that's the whole end of the story of TASAP. Um, it just works. Okay. Now, in the scaling limit, the one, two, three asymptotics, you end up your median, your, your, your initial and final operators are just going to converge to um, the transition probabilities of a Brownian motion staying above your final condition and staying below your initial condition. So that part's easy. So all the interesting st stuff comes from the mediating operators, which get rescaled like this. And it turns out that the inverse of the generator of a geometric random walk is just one plus two times the forward difference operator. So you can write that thing as e to the epsilon minus three halves times this minus grad minus that comes from the Poisson part, and then a half log one plus two grad plus, which comes from the Q inverse. And now if you just do an expansion, and in this scaling, the gradient operator is actually of order epsilon one half, because that's the scaling of the height function, this thing just becomes this d cubed. So that's where this d cubed comes from. So that's the origin of the d cubed in KBC. OK. And so after this rescaling, you get the, the transition probabilities of the KPZ fixed point. So the finite dimensional distributions of the KPZ fixed point, starting from some initial condition h0, are given by a Fredholm determinant of i minus, again, there's a k, an operator, which depends on the initial data and t and the x's and the a's. I should have called the a's r's. I'm sorry, I changed my notation here. OK. So let's look at that operator k. So there's a, there's a recipe to get k. And the recipe is called uh, Brownian scattering theory. So k actually evolves in a trivial way in t and x and a. It just, the way it changes in t and x and a is just by conjugation uh, with this e to the t over three d cubed and the x is acting with d squared and the a is acting with d's. So you should just think of this as there's a base kh0, which is this Brownian scattering transform. And once you do that, the k evolves because the, you want to know how these Markov transition probabilities evolve in t and x's. It evolves, and it, the evolution is just trivialized in the space of k's. OK. So what's kh0? That's uh, Brownian scattering theory. So we, we, um, we have our h0 this red line down below. And we ask, what's the probability that a Brownian motion starting at u1 and conditioned to go to u2 um, hits below h0? So we, below h0 is called hypo h0. It's the hypograph of h0. So you're just asking, what's the probability that the Brownian motion hits the hypograph on its little journey from minus l to l? starting at u1 and ending at u2. And that's called p hit minus l, l, u1, u2. And we can compute this for every u1 and u2. And we ask, uh, here's a question. Suppose you fix l. You could ask the question, can you recover h0 between minus l and l from the hit operator? And the answer is you can. 
we need it on the whole line. So what we do is you, you take a limit. But if you just take a limit of p hit, then it's kind of clear you would no longer be able to recover because the Brownian motion would get too blurry in the middle. So what this thing tells you to do is to solve the heat equation backwards on each side of p hit and then take the limit. So you refocus on the center. Now, you can worry that that's not legal because the operator p hit is actually not analytic across h0. But you only ever have to really compute this thing after you've hit it with e to the d cubes. And for any t not 0, once you hit it with e to the t d cubes, you can solve the heat equation backwards or forwards as much as you like. So it's not really the limit that I'm drawing that you take, but actually the limit after you put the e to the t d cubed inside. Because the image of e to the t d cubed is actually in the domain of the backwards heat equation for any time. OK. Well, so you create this operator, and it turns out that the map from h0 to this k is a continuous bijection from the space of upper semi-continuous functions into the trace class. So these probabilities make perfect sense. Of course, it's not obvious, but they are probabilities, and they do satisfy the Markov property, the chapman kolmogorov equations, and they uh, generate a Markov process called the KBZ fixed point. OK. Hey, Jeremy, just to make sure that uh, you're aware of the time, it's uh, you mean yeah. it take a few minutes. but. Uh, um, me to know if you're aware or not, so I, I, just want to... I, I can't remember when we started a five past or something. Possibly, I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, just to make sure you are. Let me quickly give you one example because the thing looks scary. <laughs> um, and then I'll dance over the history. Um, let's do narrow wedge. Narrow wedge is just the upper semi continuous function, which is zero at x equals 0 and minus infinity everywhere else. So then you can just see, you can just calculate p hit in a second. Because p hit, you just solve the heat equation for time l, and then you have a projection onto this h0, and then you solve the heat equation again for the second half of your trajectory. So. Solving the heat equation backwards off this thing is no problem. If you put the e to the minus ld cubes, d squareds on either side, it, it just gives you a projection operator. And then the e to the d cubes are just airy functions. So you see in one line that you get the classic airy kernel. And now you know by the calculation we did that you get the kp equation. And if you look at a solution of the right scaling form, it gives you an ODE, which is reduced by the Riccati transform into PAM of A2. And that gives you that you get the GUE distribution. So although the previous formula looked very scary, in any of the classic computable situation, you just compute it in a few seconds. Flat's very similar. If you want to compute the Brownian scattering transform of flat, you just use the reflection principle. And it turns out the Brownian scan scattering transform is just the reflection operator. So let me just finish up by mentioning where the formulas come from. And um, the, the history is the following. In, in 97, Gunter Schutz actually gave a formula for the n-particle transition probabilities of TASEP as an n by n determinant. And the problem with that formula is that it's extremely hard to take the n goes to infinity limit. So most of the field has actually been the subject of trying to take the angles to infinity limit of Schutz's formula. Um, in 05, there was a big breakthrough. Sasamoto and then Sasamoto, Borden, and Ferrari and Prahofer realized that Schutz's formula could be realized as a determinantal point process. It's actually not, it's a sign determinantal point process on a space of gelfand zetlin patterns. And this allowed them to turn the problem into the problem of calculating the correlation 
kernel of that determinantal point process. And that turns into a biorthogonalization problem for Charlie polynomials, shifted by the initial data of TASEP. But this problem could only be solved by guessing in a few special cases. And that's why you only knew the flat case and the narrow wedge case. Um, but by using our guess of what the KPZ fixed point is, we were able to find a general solution of this by, by orthogonalization problem. And that reduces the thing to the TASEP formula, which I showed you either, either earlier. So I'll just skip the later slides and, uh, and finish. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for, for your talk. Um, so let's see if we have uh, questions from, um, oh, so I already have a question from, from, uh, from, from the chat. So, so the question is, can, can you, is there a hope to obtain joint convergence for the KPD fix, uh, to the KPD fixed point at different times for a stronger topology than the finite dimensional one? I, uh, I, I think that should be possible. Yeah, nobody did that, but it, that sounds like a possible thing to do, just using the Markov. Jeremy, suddenly the sound became very bizarre. Are you here? Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't hear you anymore. Okay, that's fixable, just a sec. Ah. Maybe you're kind of back. You're, you're, you're gone. Okay, just, just a sec. Uh, uh, now you're, you're back, apparently. Now I'm back? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, how about now? Because I, I, I can fix it, but I have to do something. You, you, you're still here. Okay, okay, so let's, let's, let's just keep answering questions then. So yeah, I have another question also, which is, uh, so wh wh what do you think uh, would be uh, the next steps? Uh, like uh, what, wh what are the next promising directions in your opinion in, in, in this uh, study? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think <laughs> there's one very big question, which is um, why uh, KDV and KP come up? Where did these things come from? Why on earth is that true? Um, of course, the, the biggest question is to find some proof which doesn't just work by exact calculations. So, I mean, the sad thing about this whole thing is that the only way we have access at the present time to the KPZ fixed point is to do an exact calculation for some model and uh, take a limit, uh, but, but that's, relies on being able to do an exact calculation for some model. So you'd like some sort of more, a way to perturb those models and still be able to, to get to the limit. But the problem is, is that we don't really know what the limiting thing is. We just know that it satisfies all these equations and we don't quite know why. So, so those are, I think, the big questions. So, so what's your favorite way to, to think about it? Like uh, if you, you know, when, when you dream about it, or I don't know, like is there one specific property that you like to keep in your head more often than the others or? About the fixed point? Yeah, about the fixed point. Is it, is it that you know there are lots of formulas or uh, <laughs> that, that you, 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 you think are more? Well, well, the formulas, yeah, I mean, I mean, I like the formulas. I should say that, um, because I only had 50 minutes, there were things I left out. So there's also a variational formula for the fixed point, which is also very interesting. But it involves an object called the Aries sheet, and the Aries sheet's been proved to exist, and it's unique, and it's some extremely non-explicit functional of a well-known thing called the Aries line ensemble. But, um, but you know, so you can think about it as, as a, the variational formula also, and sometimes one thing's useful and sometimes another thing's useful and various things you want to prove, but we don't have a complete picture, which would answer your question. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to your question. There's sort of lots of ways to think about it, some of which are useful for some problems and some of which are useful for other problems, but not a completely coherent 
picture. So it's a very weird thing. I don't think we've ever seen something like this before. It's a Markov process where we know exactly what the transition probabilities are, but we actually don't know the mechanism of evolution. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, I'm trying to unmute someone who has a question. Yeah, there were a couple but of I'm questions. actually st struggling right now. Um, Life, can you try to unmute Amanda? For some reason, I don't seem to be able to. Yeah, maybe um, I'm no longer. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a very, very lovely, clear talk. Thank you. Um, could you go back to that slide where you showed the KPZ fixed point with all the models converging to it? Okay, just a sec. Yeah, everyone loves that slide. Okay, just a second. Um, wow, how do you, okay, that didn't work, just a second. Um, there we go, <laughs> big math. So, I mean, you, you said in all the examples you have, you, you basically compute this expression in epsilon and then just take the, the limit. Um, yeah. But presumably, the, the, the SPDE you get for free, right? That it converges to the... So, so I guess what I'm saying is if you could prove something was converged to the SPDE, then for free you would get it converged to the KPZ fixed point? Well, no, that's the problem. So the, the KPZ fixed point doesn't satisfy an SPDE. Um, the, it, the analog of the SPDE is uh, the variational formula. Um, involving this area sheet. And since we don't really know what the area sheet is, um, you can't do that. Now, it is possible that um, one would be able to try to prove universality by proving things uh, converge to the variational formula involving the area sheet. It's, it's, it's quite plausible that the best route is to use the fact that the area sheet, the, the unproved fact yet, that the area sheet is actually defined by a bunch of its qualitative properties. Um, but that hasn't been done yet. That would be the analog of what you're saying. Okay, thanks. See, it's very um, different. It, I, I just wanted to comment. It's very different to try to prove something converges to the KPZ equation. Because now that we have uh, Martin Hare and, and you know, Gubinelli's theories of, of the KPZ equation, the KPZ equation is perfectly well posed. So you can prove things converge to it just by proving things converge to this equation. But the fixed point is a different kettle of fish because the best analog of equation involves something you don't quite know what it is yet, this area sheet. Okay. So, so is it true that, that the the KPZ equation rescales to the KPZ fixed point? Someone is asking in the chat. Oh, absolutely not. Yes. No, <laughs> no, the, the, the closest anyone can prove about the KPZ equation is that the one point distribution starting from three or four initial data converge to the one point distribution of the KPZ fixed point. I see. And that's essentially what I showed you because right. there's a formula. I see. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a, it's a good time to uh, uh, reach closer, closure here. So, so uh, thank you very much for your talk. Oh, questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I missed one question. Um, uh, yeah, so, so do you have any idea why, I guess it's still a heuristic type of question. Do you have any idea why uh, TASEP, the KP equation, the KDB equation, this Theorta bilinear equation uh, come together at all? Like, is there a way to, uh, maybe is there another setting in which uh, uh, they seem to be related as well? Or I'm not sure if that is. <laughs> um, I, I would say I don't have even the slightest clue. It, it's just something one can do by algebra and there's no explanation yet. Of course, we're trying to find an explanation, but yeah. it's it's not something we. It's it's not so e not so hard to see that if if it satisfies some equation, that's probably the simplest equation it could satisfy. That's a, <laughs> that's the kind of result I I think you know you'll start seeing, but 
Um, but as I said, the question is why it would satisfy an equation. That's very strange. Yeah, so, so yeah, th thanks a lot for, for your talk. It was, it was really uh, very pleasant. Uh, thanks everyone for the participation as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to participate in this socialization experiment later, uh, stay tuned, I will say more about this. But uh, in the meantime, uh, maybe life, I will again uh, give you the, the hand to, to applaud. <laughs>